Show me the data. DevConf is an engineering conference. This crowd is a bunch of engineers. And Serena and I have been engineers all our lives. We believe in the value of data. So as we started thinking about diversity, we naturally gravitated towards, well, let's see what studies are available. Right? Let's see what the data tells us. Turns out that it's really hard to find data on diversity in open source communities in particular, a lot easier to find data about um, diversity in businesses because they have reporting requirements. But we've been examining lots and lots of data. So why would anybody care that a community is diverse? Well, you guys are all self-selected, right? I'm assuming good intent, and I'm assuming that you're here because you care about diversity and you're not here to troll us. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anybody, who, okay, anybody here to troll us, raise your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, there's always one, yeah. <laughs> uh, but there are lots of studies, but they tend to be management studies that show the business value of diversity. There are studies that look at corporate boards and corporate profits that then correlate that to the diversity of the board. But there's not so much about engineering communities. So some of the engineering community stuff is work that we are assuming extrapolates from those corporate studies. But we know that there is value to diversity because we see it all around us. So why does it matter if an open source community is made of people that look alike? or have similar life experiences. Like, look around. We have the benefits of the limited diversity that we have in the room and in the communities that we have today. Um, and the exper experiences and that are different with each, pe which e with each person helps to uh, gain variety within the group, right? Um, so we can learn more about each other this week when we're at this conference. You can even go, I know last year when I was here, there was a, uh, a candy, <coughs> a candy swap at one of the um, tables in the community room. And with a diverse group, you can likely find a lot of differences as well as uh, a lot of similarities between you. So hone in on the similarities that you have with people that you are different from, because that can help create a connection and then create trust on that. And diversity, when you find it, is a lot more fun. So here's the reason that businesses care. Diversity creates change, which is the engine for innovation. So if you, if, probably a lot of you here are Red Hatters. Um, and you know, we always talk internally about open source communities and innovation. It's a powerful driver, right? Well, diversity creates challenges. A community that's diverse has a little more friction in it. And diversity shakes things up a little bit, and that's not a bad thing. Ideas that are challenged get to prove their worth. And if everybody in the room agrees that something is a good idea, that probably says you don't have enough diversity in the room, right? Because nobody raised the question. So right there, we see value in bringing different experiences into the conversation. It's hard to fix a problem that um, it's hard to fix a problem if you don't have multiple perspectives on that problem, right? And as a code base gets out into the world and encounters users and encounters the need to interface with other code bases, the original developers experience issues, problems, difficulties that they didn't anticipate. It helps to have multiple perspectives on what those problems are, because that gives you better insights into how to fix them. You know, if you knew about the problem to begin with, right, you would have coded around it to start. But clearly, you weren't thinking about that problem. So if you have multiple perspectives, you can even think of that as a specific skill set that you want to have on a team. I mean, we want to hire that as a, a you know, well, you want a team to have multiple ways of looking at things. 
And I'm just going to add on to that a little bit because you talked about the development perspective. And I'd like to talk about the design perspective as well. We often use PRs to talk, document our designs. And sometimes when people put up a PR with a design, they get a little frustrated if there's a lot of questions around it. But oftentimes, especially with design, there's not necessarily like the right answer. So having a bunch of questions around a specific design is just as important as Docu mm -hmm. you know, questions around a technology or a PR or how you're accomplishing a task. Mm -hmm. Because we want to be able to make sure with the user experience that we're addressing a multitude or a range of different types of people. Mm -hmm. So open source means innovation. It's about collaboration and uh, inclusion. Everyone has a platform and everyone is empowered. <laughs> So we have roles here. Um, sometimes we have roles. Uh, it's about being transparent. It's allow about allowing everybody to provide input. And let's say again, like everyone should be able to in uh, provide input. That means all of us as community members need to make sure that people feel safe enough that they can provide their input and that we listen. Mm -hmm. um, so as an example, if you have an intern, you're on, an intern on your team who's just joined and is 18 years old. Listen to them. We can often learn, well, we always learn from them as much as we can from anybody else. And in my case, I happen to be one of the only woman in the distinguished engineer community at Red Hat. So it's one woman out of 56. And it's great that the people also listen to me, right? Um, so everybody needs to be able to be involved and make an impact. Think about brainstorming that can occur with a diverse team. If you have a, a room with two or three people that think alike, you can brainstorm and you can come up with a solution, but it would likely be much better if you have a diverse room of people with different roles, with different talents, from different backgrounds, and get a lot more ideas out there. Mm -hmm. So co collaboration helps foster creativity, which results in innovation. So what do they say? The way to find the best ideas is to start with a lot of ideas. So how diverse are open source communities anyway? Clearly, you know, different communities have different levels of participation from other groups. It turns out that it's really hard to get this data, but we've found several studies that can give us some of the information. So GitHub has done studies. They've got two or three studies that they've done annually. Also, um, there are some numbers out on um, Stack Overflow. And so Stack Overflow's annual developer survey, it turns out, looks at a lot of the information around participation. We've specifically started with gender differences because it's one of the easiest to measure, right? So, we went looking for studies that could give us the numbers. And here's one of the ones that we found. So this is from the Linux Foundation's Open Source Leadership Summit. Um, so it's like it's circa 2017. According to that study, 11.6% of the GSOC participants, uh, yeah, 2018 participants, were women. 10.4% of OpenStack contributors are women. 9.9% of Linux kernel contributors are women. I find that one, by the way, difficult to believe. Um, if you, okay, right? If you poke a little closer at that one, you'll see that you'll see that 6.8% of the actual code submissions are from women. And so there's clearly a difference here, right? I mean, we can measure the number of identities. But can we really, you know, we can measure the number of pull requests, but how do we map some of this stuff, right? If 9.9% if are women and only 6.8% of the contrib contributions are from them, there's something in the middle here, right? One of these things is not like the other one. Um, let's see. And where's Perry? Yeah, I'm sorry, Perry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out us. I hate to say it, only 3% of the Red Hat kernel population is female. And we try really hard to hire women. So I know right, that out in the, in the wider world, it's also, it's also really tough. OK. So imagine a world where everyone in, in the room looks exactly the same or had the same background, like everybody at this table. Um, this would be fine if the people on this table, at this table were developing something for users that look like that. And the sales guys look like that as well. But we know that that's not the case, right? Um, 
So we're representing a number of different roles here. Uh, we need to make sure that um, we have diversity by role, by gender, by, uh, by geographic. As uh, Alan mentioned, and which is something that we didn't even pick up on with all of our research, is yeah. English as a secondary language, which when you started saying it, it was like, put a bell, and we looked at each other. <laughs> we take that so, one for granted. Yes. Yeah, which yeah. is sad. And we also have to make the point that we are focusing on women, but that's because that's where OK, we, we have a bias. <laughs> we do have a bias there. <laughs> so again, you had some really good points in, in your conversation there. Um, so I think the, the main point here is that it's not, it's not also all about writing code, right? You're writing code for users. Um, so open source communities initially were all, all comprised of just developers. And you know they were 100% uh, focused on what they were doing, what they were writing, what they wanted to focus on. But you know, was there a roadmap? Were there use cases? Was there a design? Were there personas? Did they consider any of that? Did they think about how the users going to, were going to use the product? Did they think about how they were going to learn about the product? Um, Got to go to the next slide. So complementary skills are an asset, right? You look at this right now, and let's take it a step further. Here's a small example of a development with of development without design. So somebody created this as their initial web page. Anybody? Can you make sense of that? I mean, it's pretty hard to read. If you knew to put the cursor up at the top right-hand corner of the page, what you'd actually actually see was this. So if you had a designer along with that developer, you could have probably <laughs> figure that one out beforehand and save some time, right? So before 2013, open source was UIs were just doing enough. But starting in 2014, um, they started to invest more in user experience. This is from a number of reasons. Our competition, we're actually now competing mm -hmm. with a lot of the big companies that are investing a lot of money in UX, right? Um, so a few years later, we're now seeing a lot more investment in the practice of UX. Again, we can take Red Hat, for example. I joined the company in 2014, and we had a UX team of 18 people. We're now at about 106, which is amazing. Um, so things, think about how things could have changed in open source if the, the community was more diverse by role at the beginning. And think about the diversity of users that you're trying to go after and all those different experiences. So do communities reflect corporations? Well, I'm really sad to say this. It's really kind of embarrassing, but the data that we found strongly suggests that corporations have made a lot more progress than communities have in attracting women into technical roles. Um, the studies that we found show that corporations now are more diverse than communities are. Which, you know, if you look at some of our numbers, I mean, you see, it kind of makes sense. Right? On the internet, nobody knows you're a cat. I had to get a cat picture in, anybody who knows me. Um, so it, yeah, and as we said, it's really hard to get data on open source participation. You have to rely on guesses based upon gendered names. And there are open source tools that you can use to try to go and examine um, profiles and try to determine gender based upon profile. Um, and some studies have done that. A lot of it is self-reported, though. Right? So GitHub did a huge study. They had like 5,500 responses. And of all of those responses, 95% was white male. Um, which says that people of color and females were 5% of the folks on, on GitHub. I think we're, Oops. I'm just trying to make it. Are we? I think we're up. Oh, man. Sorry. <laughs> Hang on a sec. Yeah. OK. So I'm lost. <laughs> but we're moving on. Professional computer programmers. The numbers, according to the government, the US government, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, show that 22.6% of professional computer programmers are female. And that actually maps pretty well 
to some of the corporate numbers that we've seen published. So Wired published this table, which shows over time how participation of women in technical roles has advanced in companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft and Facebook. So, you know, they've grown the role of women in technical jobs from 14, 15, 17% in 2014 to 2019 numbers, anywhere from 20 to 23%. Um, Intel has similar numbers, by the way. Intel's participation is like 20, 21% at this point. A lot of the numbers that you find are a little bit misleading because when companies report their numbers, oftentimes they're reporting women overall. And so there are lots of women in roles like finance and human resources, right? And that can kind of inflate the numbers. So if you look at overall numbers for any of these corporations, they're gonna be higher. But technical roles, which is what I personally care about, right? Sorry. Um, the numbers are, are significantly lower. If you then compare this with um, the, the numbers from open source, right? The, the GitHub numbers that I, I just quoted, you see there's, there's a real big difference. It's changing a little bit. So we found a study that looked at participation in hackerspaces. And there, it, especially that tends to be a younger demographic. And there the rate was like maybe 20% of the participants are female. So we think that this might be shifting over time. I just wanted to call one thing out here, too. It's interesting that Microsoft and, App and Apple are considered you know, more old school and more founded in the 70s, mm -hmm. but their numbers are still so high. So I thought that was, that was yeah. a good feeling, I think, in the, corporate, in the corporate area. But now, let's go yeah. back over here. Yes. So years of experience by gender. This slide actually gives me hope. These numbers look at women in technical roles and the, not, the years of ex, um, their, their ages, right? Or their, their, I'm sorry, not their ages, their years of experience. What this slide is showing is that for zero to nine years of experience in technical positions, 66.2% of women fall into that category. 52.9% of non-binary, genderqueer, non-conforming, all self-identified, right, of, of people in technical roles uh, have less than nine years of experience. And 50.1% of men in those roles have less than nine years of experience. But what this slide, I'm hoping, says is that the pipeline is expanding. It's a different demographic as you get younger. Um, so this gives me hope that, that more women are coming into the field. We'll see if that's actually true. Yeah. Oh, another, another interesting um, look, another interesting study that we found talked about um, the, overall development, the overall development roles. This, I think this was from what um, Stack Overflow, from the developer study. They looked at what roles were uh, women tended to move into, right? So what do you think the most popular technical roles are with women? Designer. Designer. That's one. That's one. Testing. Testing, That's yes. That was, that was a big one. Yep. Architecture. Yeah, no. Not that so one. much. Yeah. Yeah. People say writer. Yeah, documentation. Documentation was one. Yep. Was that yep. One? Uh, what the project name oh, project that one was like right on the border. So that was like 50 50. Support yeah, support is another one. Mm -hmm. No, SRE tends, that skews male, which was yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, let's hope. <laughs> Another, another one was data scientists, right? Women, women are coming into data science. Um, and then, let's see, what else? What else did we have? I missed one. I missed an interesting one. I don't know how to get down there. The difference between, 
Yeah. Oh, anyway, yeah. anyway, there's what one that I missed. One? That was oh, oh, oh yeah, wait a second. Front end development. That was yeah, web one. developers. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that yeah. So that yeah. was really interesting. But it, the back end, um, the database, the DBAs, the database. That's that skews mail. Yeah. And I'm also just gonna call out to UX again at Red Hat. So Red Hat, we have about a 50-50 breakup in our UX department, which is interesting and it aligns with this because we have front end development and we have design in there uh, as well as research. But it's interesting that we kind of mm -hmm. align with those numbers there, so. Yeah, so we're reinforcing stereotypes everywhere. <laughs> so this goes back to the numbers that uh, Denise had talked about with the GitHub survey. So it was actually a, an open source, the survey was included open source uh, users and developers. But what this, these numbers actually are about is the uh, demographics of those people who answered the questions, right? So on those respondents. So the 95% of the people who took the survey were male. 3% were female and, and one was uh, the non-binary. Um, so why are open source communities predominantly male? What, do, can we figure this one out? Like it would be nice to understand. Um, or maybe was the survey just missed a lot of, you know, these other roles that we talked about, like designers and front end developers. Maybe it just did go to the, mm. some of those communities that were more mm -hmm. focused on the back end. We don't really know. Yeah, except that we know that communities are different, right? So some like the GNOME community have been, great at doing outreach and so for years um, they've been putting they've been putting focus on things projects like outreach right um, so we see more folks from those communities so here's where we get to talk about cultural stereotypes can you spot the genius well I bet there's one here that you can probably name and maybe two right so curiosity intelligence, perseverance, productivity, and a big chunk of good luck to get the visibility are characteristics that are associated with genius. Um, it may not look exactly like what our knee-jerk reaction says it looks like. Um, real talent has never been in huge supply. Right? Um, and it can be easy to overlook talent, genius, when it doesn't fit into your, your mental mindset, your first impression of what it should look like. So Ada Lovelace, Alice Bell, tragic story there, um, Charles Turner, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, um, Srini Ramanujan, right? some, some people have never heard of these amazing people. And yet, probably everybody's heard of Alvin. Um, so true confession, I have biases. Probably every one of you does as well. There's a fascinating link through the Harvard Business Review that lets you go and take a test of your biases. And I forgot to put the link in here. I'm sorry, but I'll share, I'll share it later. But when you go and take these tests, you really discover that, yeah, I guess I'm like everybody else, right? Um, yeah, I can't get, it's hard to get beyond my biases. It's a loaded term, but, but we can't not have biases, right? Because none of us have unlimited compute power. And a bias is the brain's attempt at efficiency. We can't or at least it's really hard to recompute everything all the time. And so we, we set up these mental shortcuts for ourselves. It's perfectly normal, it's perfectly natural, but sometimes you have to just step back and say, hmm, am I looking at all the data? Have I, have I, been, have I been sufficiently proactive? Have I gotten out of my mental model? Have I oversimplified a little bit? And if I just step back and start thinking a little bit wider, can I maybe see the potential in this person? The potential, rather than perhaps a past history of accomplishments, potential that might make them a really distinguished and interesting member of our team to fill a role that we didn't even know we needed. Right? Steph, thank you for that one. 
<laughs> so, so just try to think a little bit more, a little bit wider when you meet somebody and toss your biases, at least briefly, before you slot them immediately. Well, we have biases about age, about gender, about color, about race, about ethnicity, all this stuff, right? Try to dump them and take the time to recompute. Okay. Ah, so what are corporations that do and that we're not? So, okay. Cindy Lauper said it best. Money changes everything. Uh, corporations have thrown a lot of money at recruiting to, um, to find diversity candidates. And wouldn't it be nice to have a huge budget to go and attract females and attract others who might be different into the field? We do a lot of grassroots efforts, right? And there's a lot invested in grassroots efforts, but boy, it would be great to have focus right from the top with a huge budget to come in, go along with it. But corporations also have legal requirements that they have to think about and that motivate their hiring. And in recent years, a really good development has been that they have to report their diversity numbers publicly. So for instance, if you go to Red Hat's website, you can see our numbers for diversity in technical roles. And I'm embarrassed to say, unlike some of our competition, 14%, right? But we are on a mission to do better. And we're kind of in that middle ground because we recruit a lot out of open source communities. We're motivated to help make open source communities more diverse because then everybody gets better. Mm -hmm. So what can communities do? So be more inviting. Successful projects have an on-ramp, right? So here are some, some things that you can do in your community project or conference to be more inviting. And Alon, actually his presentation before us has, is, was yeah. much more detailed on uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about, code of conduct, that type of thing. Um, but if you, you know, if you have a website, show interesting demographics on your site. Here we have a picture of the Grace Hopper celebration where you see a, a number of women that do look different. Here's another one, which is the, what is it, the GitHub Octagados uh, community. There's all kinds of fun things you can do within your community to have it look more inviting and look like it, you're, you want to attract different types of people mm -hmm. with different backgrounds, right? Um, so be patient. When people are coming in, be happy to guide them into new open source communities. Provide a list of open issues that are welcome to be taken by people who are new and be really patient when they put up their PRs, right? Because the worst thing you can do is put up a PR and say, oh, this is all wrong, right? Yeah, so, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so when you create these uh, communities and, and you, and you want to be more inviting, make sure that you in, invite your friends too. And you know, it can be a, a, it can be a really fun effort. Yeah. Other things that you can do to increase di gender diversity, you know, you can consider speaking at a women's conference or um, at, you know, go to the hackathon and, and be a judge. You can attend a Grace Hopper conference and even at, at those things you can also recruit there. I know that we do that right at Red Hat. Mm -hmm. um, to address age diversity, there's different things you can do like partner with educators at universities. Uh, you can look into mentoring opportunities with high schools that are nearby. And heck, you can start at home, right? If you have children, start sharing what you do about work with them. Let them know that you can learn from them just as much as they can learn from you. I did that. <laughs> and I have got a daughter who works at Red Hat as an inter uh, interaction designer. I have a son who is a cloud architect. So it kind of worked for me. So like, it's fun. <laughs> Nothing better than yeah. like when they're all grown up, you come home and talk about work. It's actually pretty fun. <laughs> Kind of sad, but fun. Ah. Oh. <laughs> but anyways, you the can also Christmas bring- The Christmas dinner table must yes, be fun at your house. Yeah. My parents are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, you know, like there's the bring your children to work day, right? I think there's a national day now. I think it's April 23rd this year, 2020. All across the world, you should be able to bring your kids to school. I mean, bring your kids to work so that they learn more. Um, le let them learn about what you're doing. And, and also, you know, I was talking about children, but specifically for girls. Let them know that it's okay to be smart. 
and it's okay to like math mm -hmm. and science. Like getting kids at an early age to understand that mm -hmm. and getting the sons to understand that it's okay too for his sister. Um, but it's really important. And I think people are doing that much more now than they did mm -hmm. when we were younger, right? When I, I was a computer science major and I think I was one of two girls who graduated in my grade. Hopefully it's a lot better than that now. And different cultures have different stereotypes, right? Or different ideas about what jobs are suitable for women. So if you look in some geographies, computer science, the classes actually are skewed female. I, I, I was amazed. Um, so there is hope. It's just that in Western Europe, in the United States, in, culture, in these cultures, it's over time the stereotype has become that this is not a good job for women. Uh, we can do better, though. We can change that stereotype. So, get to get steal good ideas from each other, right? So Fedora started out doing a candy swap. People from different backgrounds bring in candies from their their culture, and explain it, and everybody gets to try um, something dif different. Now I see we're doing it over here, right? There's a candy swap going on just on the other side of the aisle over here, which is great. You guys should check that out, because it looked like there was some really good stuff. Um, but that's just one idea, right? You can do, th this is a photo from here last year. Uh, steal the good ideas that you see at other conferences and promote them. So <laughs> DNI communities are terrific support group mechanisms, right? But we should also consider, while well, the primary goal is to be supportive, we don't want to be looked at as um, not being, like not letting other people come in and, and see what we're doing, right? So allow the outsiders to get a glimpse of what it's like to be inside. Open up the doors and let people see that. People who have never been in that situation probably don't know what it feels like. So, like the whole thing with biases, sometimes it's just an inherent bias. They don't understand what it's like to be in your situation. So sometimes it's completely, really unintentional, right? But if you let them join in, that will empower others to understand what it's really like. And as this is saying, you know, knowledge is power. So the more we educate, the more hopefully we can help change. So the future will be different. You've already seen my hopeful slide, the changing numbers on the age demographic from Stack Overflow. Can you spot the genius in this slide? Yeah, me either. But the genius is in there somewhere. So first, I want you to meet the space ants. The space ants are a Lego League team they are from a small township in South Africa. 2019, they, were, they went to the worldwide championships in Lebanon and won. Some of these kids had never been on a plane before. Right? Some of these kids had never left the country, never left the township. What I love about this, what I truly love about this are the crazy divas. The crazy divas are from a different township in South Africa. And in 2012, they were one of the first to get to a Lego League championship in Malaysia. And they didn't win, but they came back and shared their experience. And when they got home, they started mentoring some of the other teams. And now look, 2019, South Africa, a South African team, is winning. It shows you the value of what you do when you contribute. There's lots of projects going on. So like CoLab is a project that, that Red Hat sponsors, right? Where we, we bring kids in and help them, help them deal with game, help them write games. Um, there's another project called the Rose Project. There are, there are STEM outreach projects everywhere. And it's, it's the thing that's going to change the demographic over time, because people are going to become convinced that it is possible for me to do this thing. I'm old enough that when I first got into computer science, nobody told us we couldn't do it, right? 
um, it was still a brand new field. And nobody said you can't. Because there weren't enough, there, there weren't enough people writing code. There was no stereotype yet. And it's, well, OK, sure, I guess I can do that. And then suddenly, there weren't any women anymore. Um, and now we're starting to see women come back. And it really is exciting for me. I'm really hopeful that we can get another generation back here. Um, and open source is a thing that's going to get them in. OK, so how can you make a difference? Um, as we just saw the numbers saying, open source in the numbers in open source are less diverse than the numbers that are in corporations. So what are we doing wrong? And how can you make a difference? Um, it kind of seems like an oxymoron, because open source is supposed to be open and inclusive. So like, what's the problem? So even though maintainers set the example, uh, anyone can, anyone can help, help change the culture, right? So call out bad behavior. And in fact, everyone can help change the culture. Yes. Find ways to call out bad behavior. Uh, yeah. I don't know if anybody in this room has any suggestions. It can yeah. be in a meeting. It could be a comments on a PR. Yeah. It, you know, sometimes you can take somebody aside and talk to them. Other times, maybe it's better to gently say something in the room. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But being able to help Defense. change. Mm -hmm. If you see bad behavior, don't let it go, right? So I'm still in Rain's favorite phrase, right? We don't do that here. Um, we don't do that here. What a powerful statement. Because it establishes a community norm. And commu people, people are social, right? We're social creatures. We follow the pack. And we don't do that here, says a lot about the way that a community operates. Um, sometimes it's hard to stand up for somebody else. Although, you know, so it can actually it can be easier to stand up for somebody else than to stand up for yourself. Um, so when you, when you see it, Defend it. Yeah. And I'd also say the maintainer is very impactful in order to say that. So that if you are the maintainer, be even more conscious about it. And it's also much easier for like a woman to stand up for a woman or uh, other mm -hmm. examples of. Uh, but if you're standing up for somebody who's not the same minority as you are, it's, it makes a bigger difference, right? I think I just saw a, a question a from a maintainer in our audience. <laughs> so I think it's really interesting that you bring up the differences in approach between one company and another one. To me, the most difficult aspect of this is that for someone who's higher ranked and more respected and has more time in the community, yeah. uh, I think a private discussion often is more effective. However, <clears throat> that takes away the impression you get from the new people that you will follow them. Yeah. So, because from a certain perspective, it's important to in, uh, imprint upon their brains at that moment. We don't do that here. Right, and they don't have to go home and like, oh my god, that just happened. No one said anything. Right. So there's a trade-off. Like, you know, more effectively push back on the work experience and higher rank person, but at the same time, you may not give the impression of the new people that you would like to go back. Yeah. To. I agree with you. It's a quandary, right? Because your goal is to change the behavior, and yet your goal is also to demonstrate that you're changing the behavior. And so, yeah, it's going to be an in-the-moment call. And it's also, it's a big responsibility when you're one of those when you're one of those people. Exactly. But if you're um, a new person doing stuff like that, I will call it out immediately in front of other people always. Yeah. Gently. I really like gently. I like this example as well because it's mm. like you're not really putting somebody on the spot and like reacting in a negative way back to them. You're just saying, "Hey, mm. that ain't right, right?" You yeah, can just move not on. our community. Mm. Okay, of, so yeah, Vincent, Vincent was the first, I think. No, uh, in, in, the, in the projects that I've worked in, that's, that's often the case. Uh, it, how you handle it, like whether it's like an active confrontation. Most people don't want confrontation. Yeah. Them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I tend to, and, and this can this can get almost a philosophical or sociological conversation. I love humor because humor both divides us and draws us together. So often when that happens, I end up having making it 
something that you can laugh at together and not ever allowing humor to happen where it divides at all. Because yeah. often people choose a side then. Yeah. It worse. Um, but humor often plays into that and smooths it over like, we don't do that here, but we're still moving together, moving forward together. Um, so for me, mm -hmm. that's, that's humor. And but, like, but this humor is an art. It is absolutely yeah. Yeah. I don't own that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think assume good intent, yeah. right? No, can you give us an example? Like when other people are imitating people's hair, I don't know. We should, yeah, we need a shot of Steph. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Steph is rocking the look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a question. Yes, yeah, sir, you had a question. So, a relatively young community that I'm in is what I'm calling the Polybox. And I think the good thing about that is because it's a merged patch, it's sort of set as a rule. So, the programmers get quite strict about code formatting and they also use words. So, you code the Polybox in there. You can't argue with it, you've accepted it as a community. It's just not how to use it. So it's like part of your style guide. Yeah, it's the code of conduct. How yeah. Do you yourself in this yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting word. I like that. Mm -hmm. What community is that? Oh, it's a uh, key lime. Oh, okay. Oh. Key lime. Good. So, see, look, key lime, a welcoming community. Bring your friends. <laughs> Having a mentor or a sponsor definitely That's helps, huge. right? It helps that person be able to gain more self-confidence in that. Yeah. How do people in your in, in key, the Key Lime community request help? Um, is there like a, a means they can just? Yeah, we, we have good first issues. Okay, and there's a site I can't remember, but they aggregate that label somehow. They they go get published and they get the So you d you'll reach out. That's You're great. You're a busy man. That's awesome. Scaling. Well, by that time, you'll have mentored enough people exactly. into the community oh. that they'll pass it <laughs> along, right? Gentleman in the back, yes. Please. So, often in open source communities, there are diversity and inclusion working groups. Just to mention a few, the Fedora community has a diversity and inclusion team that's 100% volunteer driven. The GNOME team has a DNI team. LibreOffice has communities. And being involved in that team, we do things where we're, what we are able to do and who we are able to reach out to is so dependent on the people we have in our community. So in Fedora, for example, we focus a lot on women because a lot of times women are the ones who are in our team. And we get to do things like the candy swaps. We do speak a native na speak a native language hour at our events. Yeah, I love that idea. That's yeah. Awesome. Their, their language. And we've done imposter syndrome workshops and privilege walks. And these are things that are we are enabled by the people who show up willing to help us with these ideas. And so if you're looking for a way to make a difference in your open source community, see if there is Ah, uh, that's great. Yeah. Okay. I think you were next. Uh, Mary, right? Uh, no, Kira. Kira. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the thing that's really 
Yeah. Yeah, something that's worth knowing, I think, because we've gone already, is that the way you treat new people, regardless of who they are, is really But it's not enough. It's not enough. Because gender girls are still children. There are adult women. They don't necessarily need to have new, like to be taught how to code. They wouldn't know how to code. But if you don't have an easy pathway for how to bring in contributors, all contributors, people who are having you know, two levels of difficulty will see that. So I watch how you might treat in your community new men. If you're mean to them, you might not to me. I don't necessarily know. So it's great that you just said that because that kind of mm. almost could be an answer to the, some of the, the numbers that we found, right? Mm. Where the, where the mm -hmm. number of women in the community was larger than the number that was contributing because yeah. they don't feel s safe don't feel or confident enough, right? So, and I'm sure that's also with other types, you know, with other minority groupings, for sure. Well, Nils made a great point yesterday about code reviews. I, I, do you want to, can you repeat that? I, 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 that really made an impression on me. Yeah, and I, I like that. It's like I conform to this style. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it was do the review, and did they write it the way that I would have written it? Well, maybe not, but does it get the correct result? Yes. So, gee, there you go. And uh, also on, on that as well, just quickly, we found that article last night when oh, we were yeah. like, we're looking at some of the facts and numbers. And this is about 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that we did find in one of the articles was that uh, oftentimes the number of comments on a PR is it substantially more if it was submitted by a woman than by a male. Now, of course, this was diversity in women that they were investigating. That they were looking at, yeah. Um, but still, I mean, I don't know that we know that for sure, but it was in an article that we did read, so. Neil, I think you were next. Sure. Um, it seems to me like Red Hat has a great opportunity here because they're so involved in so many communities to try to think about how to impact this and, and you know, make some of the communities more diverse. Maybe so you guys are thinking of strategies to use Red Hatters to help. That's my job this year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hugh.
at least something that we can start the conversation about, right? Because it's like, is it correct? Right? Does it get the result that we needed? Yeah. Yeah, Larry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make an observation. Um, you and I go back over 30 years. We worked together for over 30 years. I We're old, Larry. Come on. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, we're a protected class. <laughs> Yes. From there, I went to AT and T, Bell Labs. I went to Wang Labs, the digital, the little known yeah. digital. Yeah. It was the third to forty percent. Those are the days I remember. Yeah. yeah. But then, as the years passed, a certain amount of time, and in the past, uh, I, you know, I went to grad school, and as I went to grad school, a couple different times, there were fewer and fewer emails, and just something changed with the demographics that caused me to grab them. I don't know what it is, but in the very Yeah. So two years ago, I taught an OS class, and it was about 50 50. And this past semester, I finished teaching, and we of the there's a high dropout rate in this class. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. I wasn't yeah, in the yeah. Class, but, I <laughs> but, anyways, over 50% of the people in the class were females. And so the wow. That's awesome. Is swinging back yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. right. So something is changing. The historical perspective on this is that originally software development was not considered cool work. Yeah. Like back in the vacuum tube days. So also yeah. We don't go back that far. <laughs> so predominantly, software developers were all women. Mm -hmm. who, guess who invented high level languages? Yeah. Women, right? Grace Hopper. And the men were like, well, only fixing the hardware and changing the vacuum tubes. That was that was like male work, right? Yeah. That changed over time, and then what happened was the home computer. This started to favor males mm -hmm. because males would sit at home and play with the home computer and have a, a distinct advantage when you got into the actual classroom environment and women mm -hmm. were doing other things other than that. And I think. Mm. We found a statistic on that, by the way. They were looking at what age were you when you wrote your first line of code, and that age was significantly older for women than for men. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that Raspberry Pis give us a great opportunity now, right? Because you can get your hands on the hardware again. Yeah. Yeah. It's like so much easier and more fun to be directly involved and to see the immediate results of what you do. Yes. Katja. Oh, sorry. So on the point well, you got the statistics you put up earlier about open source being very, very strongly male dominated. I think it was three percent or something um, for for mm. all those candidates. Yeah. Um, According to that survey, it was, right? right but so what a presumption that that is vaguely accurate to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, that is a factor of seven, a factor of eight, or more out of what I see in industry. Now I appreciate your point is about regarding different countries and different uh, mm -hmm. cultures. Um, I mean, the gender balance for the teams that I, that I work with in India and uh, the Czech Republic and Poland are vastly better yeah. than America and the UK. Uh, you know, on the order of 50, 50, 60, 40 at worst. Um, whereas in the UK and America, you're, you're talking maybe one, one female candidate out of 25, 30. Mm -hmm. But that aside, why is the open source community given the reduced barriers to entry, or perceived reduced barriers to entry, so far off of where entry is. So I don't think just investment alone explains that. Yeah. Do we have yeah. more, is yeah. there more data, or is that something that's not going to be looked into enough yet? I think it's scary to put your code out in public. Because you put yourself out in public and you open yourself up for criticism. And if you're not part of a community where you trust that they are going to not stomp all over you, when you do that, you're probably not going to put your code out in public. And therefore, you're not going to participate as much. That's my personal theory. Right. And we are out of time. But can I just say thank you all for a fabulous discussion. Thank you. Yeah.